Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Old Hope, and this is our regular weekly message. We're starting a brand new series entitled False Teachings. In this series, I would like to discuss church doctrine. And I'd like to make this like a living series where we add to it as needed. This part one is entitled Danger of Universalism. So I want to take a practical look at what scripture says about universalism. Let me just define that for you. Universalism is the teaching and the belief that all people will be saved regardless of their belief, regardless of their actions. It does not matter whether or not you believe in Jesus. It doesn't matter whether or not you serve another God. Even though Jesus said that he is the only way to the Father. Apparently, through this teaching, you can find another way to the Father. And someone may say, but why are you meddling, Brother Kenny? Well, Paul told young Timothy to be prepared to correct doctrine, false doctrine. And why is that so important? Why is it so important to correct false doctrine? Because false doctrine leads you away from Christ. It leads you down a slippery path that is sometimes hard, if not impossible, to come back from or to recover from. So, for this, I want to read a pretty lengthy portion of Scripture. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 7. Verse 13 through 27. And this is Jesus speaking. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus said in verse 13 and 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Jesus instructs, even warns his hearers, enter by the narrow gate. Keep away from the broad gate. Keep off of that broad path. Stick to the narrow path. So what I want us to do is to Think about this like rational people. Let us think about what it was that Jesus was teaching there about this broad gate, this narrow gate. So with that in mind, the question that begs to be answered is this. 
Why would Jesus warn people to enter the narrow gate? Or better yet, why are there two gates to begin with? Well, let's answer that last question first. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. So, that last question. Why are there two gates to begin with? There are two gates because there are two paths. There are two paths because there are two destinations. One destination leads to life. The other destination leads to destruction. In other words, it leads to the lake of fire. Oh, my brother Kenny, a good God would never ever send people to a place of eternal torment. True, that's true. But you can elect or you can decide to go there by your own choices, by the things you do, by your own actions. You yourself can sentence someone else there by withholding the good news from them or by teaching them false doctrines. I remember one time that a man came into my, my office and we were talking and he, he, he seemed to be, he was talking about his, his, um, his personal life and he seemed to be trying to get things off his chest. Or, so I didn't interrupt him, I just let him talk. And, but I was thinking all the time like, you know, I need to share the good news. I need to ask him about Jesus. I need to ask him what he, his thoughts are of Jesus and if, if he knows Jesus is his Lord and Savior. But I didn't interrupt him. And finally, the conversation ended and he had to leave. And I thought to myself, ah, well, that's fine. That's okay. He always comes in here. So the next time he comes in, I'll ask him. I'll have my opportunity then. But you know what? I never saw that man again. Two or three weeks later, I found out he had died. That was my last opportunity to witness to that man. And even now, it still haunts me that, 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 that I missed that opportunity to share the good news. You see, God does not just decide to send people to a place like that, a place of eternal torment. We are given a choice. And once we make our choice, either for the broad way or the narrow way, and hopefully we, we decide the narrow way because the narrow way leads to life. Once we decide life, I choose life, then we would help other people to make the right choice that they too might choose life. That is our mission in this life. And that's the reason why Jesus warned people to enter the narrow gate because the alternative is the broad gate and that leads to destruction. So enter the narrow gate. Jesus warned us. You see, there's, there's only two gates. There's only two paths. There's only two destinations. One to life and one to destruction. Choose wisely. Heaven is not Rome. Apparently, during the Roman Empire, they said that all roads led to Rome. You ever heard of saying all roads lead to Rome? That's where it came from. Well, heaven is not Rome. All roads do not lead to heaven. All roads do not lead to God. Jesus is the only way to God. You see, there are two gates. There are two roads. And if all roads lead to God, then in that case, why is it necessary for us to preach the good news? Why do we preach at all? Why, why do we have church? If for some reason, even those who hate God, even those who kill his prophets, even those who shut up the gospel, who take prayer out of school, even those who hate God who are going to live with them forever. Why bother? Another question, please. Why would it be more tolerable? Why would Jesus say it's more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that generation? that he was living in. Let us take a look at two scriptures. 
One found in Matthew chapter 10, the other in Matthew chapter 11. So the first one, Matthew chapter 10, verse 14 through 15. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 through 24. This is Jesus speaking. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I, I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. It sounds like to me that it's all about a repentant heart and not some cosmic universal blanket salvation that's going to happen to you whether you want it or not. It sounds to me that there are two destinations, one bearable and one not bearable. One to a good place, life, and the other to a bad place, destruction. Jesus said that Woe to you because you did not listen, because you did not hear, because you did not repent. He said, even Sodom and Gomorrah, if the mighty works, if somebody was there that, that, that done mighty works and many signs and wonders and miracles, they would have known that God is God and there is a God and they will have to give give an account to him, they would have repented and they would have remained, but instead they were destroyed. See, the travesty of, of, of that type of teaching, that is, instead of obeying the great commission, go ye in all the, the world and proclaim the good news to everyone. Instead of obeying that and, and doing that and trying to win the world for Jesus, they're writing and posting universal salvation, which, which means that the gospel doesn't really have to be taught. But the gospel does not support something like that. It says that there are two destinations. So instead of them giving the, the good news, going in, in, into all the world, they're saying, don't worry about it, world. You're going to be saved anyway. I don't have to tell you about Jesus. You're going to be saved. Which is a lie. Did you notice what Jesus said in, in verses 21 and 22? He says, if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Because they had seen the mighty works of Jesus, but refused to repent. And they would not tell anyone else about the good news. They would not let it be shared. And that is exactly what is being happened, what is happening right now in today's time. Instead of us taking the good news to those who have not heard, they keep the gospel to themselves. They keep the gospel shut up. And they're like, oh, it's okay because God does not expect us to go into all of the world and share the good news. And if he doesn't expect us to go, then he can't make you guilty for me not doing my job. So you, you're going to be okay. God's, God's not going to hold either one of us responsible. God said, go into all the world and preach the good news. Do not tell them that they will be saved without my son, Jesus, without his death, without his resurrection without his free gift of salvation. It is our Christian job, our Christian duty to win the world for Jesus, at least die trying. So my question is, 
Are you taking the good news to everyone in the world? Why do you think Paul worked so hard at evangelizing the whole world? Because without it, without him evangelizing the whole world, people would be doomed. So the onus is on us to tell the whole world about Jesus. But lazy Christians refuse to go into all the world. They refuse to preach the good news. They refuse to go. Do you share the good news when you go out? Do you turn the whole world upside down with the gospel? Or do your co-workers even know that you're a Christian? If you can't go, then send someone else. Send someone who will. Support missionaries that are willing to put their lives on the line. And do not belittle the work, the sacrifice that they make as if it was a useless task since everyone will be saved, whether they want to or not, whether they go or not. Because when you say that everybody will be saved, those people who take their wives, their children, their, their little ones, and they venture off into these places like China and, and, and Muslim countries where you lose your life for even mentioning the name of Jesus, much less for being a Christian. You belittle the sacrifice that they make when you say that they don't need to go, they don't need to do that because those people are going to be saved anyway. What you need to do is to support them. What you need to do is to join them. So how much you believe in the Great Commission will certainly show, it will certainly reflect in your bank account. Do not be confused with the scripture that says, every knee shall bow. That's found in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, Romans chapter 14, verse 11, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. That does not mean that every knee will bow in true submission and with a real repentant heart. When it says that every tongue will confess, that does not mean that they're confessing their sins. That means that they acknowledge that Jesus is God and that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, they are forced to tell the truth, to confess the truth, not confess unto salvation. See, they will be, they will not be forced to receive what they have rejected all of their lives. It will be the same argument that that says that 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 God wouldn't get any glory if they're forced to acknowledge who Jesus is. Well, God won't get any glory either. It's this, that same argument, God won't get any glory if, if they're forced to receive a salvation or forced to repent, forced to accept what they have rejected. What glory would that be to God when he's forcing them to accept it? Verse 15. It says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Some people don't even realize that they're false prophets, that they're preaching a gospel that is contrary to the gospel that Paul preached. Jesus refers to these false teachers as ravenous wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. They dress like Christians, they talk like Christians, they act like Christians, but their teaching is a false teaching with the, that gives a false sense of security and puts unsuspecting people in a dangerous, unrepentant state. So why would Paul risk his life? Why would Paul suffer so much if everybody is going to be saved regardless? So instead of winning the world for Jesus, these false prophets are lulling the world to sleep with their false doctrines. Look at what Paul told the Thessalonians that would happen in the last days. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. 
For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Did you see that? They will not escape. But escape what? Escape the sudden destruction that is coming on all people who have rejected the Lord Jesus. And that is why it is so important that we tell everyone that the return of Jesus is near. The return of Jesus is at hand. Instead of telling them, oh, peace. You're, 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 you don't have to worry about anything. Because when we say peace and safety, peace and security, then sudden destruction shall come upon them. We have lulled them to sleep. We should be either going into the mission fields or we should be sending missionaries into the mission fields and to, to places like China, the Middle East, that they too may have an opportunity to be saved. But instead, we write these treaties that says, everybody's going to be saved. You don't have to worry. You don't have to go. You don't have to send anyone. They're safe, which is contrary to the Bible. Matter of fact, it's a lie. Those of us who have heard the gospel are charged with the responsibility of bringing the good news to a dead and dying world. So are you obeying your call? Are you true to your responsibility? Did you accept the commission Jesus gave you? But instead of telling others, we create fables to soothe our own conscience. And there is no need to tell the world about Jesus because the whole world will be saved whether they like it or whether they don't like it, whether they want it or whether they don't want it. They will be saved. So the real true danger of universalism is it makes people lax. They become lazy and careless with the gospel. They, they quit preaching. They quit Telling, they quit going. If everyone will eventually be saved, then why bother? Let me just enjoy the world. Let me enjoy the things of the world. Even if God said that a friend of the world is an enemy to him, I can be a friend because God's not going to send me to eternal punishment. Let me eat, drink, and be married for tomorrow I die. Because I'll be saved anyway. We stop trying to win souls and we start concentrating on winning political favor and winning riches. We put more priority in the things of the world than in souls, precious souls. There's no doubt that our priorities would be changed, will be changed, if there is imminent danger of souls going to an eternal punishment. That would, as it were, put a fire under us to tell people of the good news, to save them from a lake of fire. But since there's no impending danger of that ever happening, of people ever going to a place called the lake of fire, we feel it's okay. We feel that it's even our right to stay safe and sound in our little world, climbing the corporate ladder instead of trying to win souls wherever those souls may be. But someone will ask, don't you know that that is insulting and offending? Well, here's what Jesus said when forced or faced with the same question. Matthew chapter 15, verse 12 through 14. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Jesus said, they are blind guides. Meaning, they do not understand what they are teaching. What they are preaching. In fact, their teaching is inaccurate. It is erroneous. It leads to Fallen in the pit. 
He said that they, being blind guides, meaning that they don't fully understand the Word of God or what they're teaching, although they think that they do, will lead others and both will fall in the pit because they're both blind. The blind lead the blind. It doesn't sound like they will accidentally stumble into the promised land or accidentally stumble into heaven. No, they will fall into a pit because every tree that our Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. You can't make a new gospel and expect God to, 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 to honor that gospel. No, there's one gospel and every tree that he has not planted will be uprooted. Every tree that does not bear fruit will be uprooted. You just don't get to choose, pick, choose, and refuse. There's but one way to Jesus. Or one way to, to eternal life, and that is Jesus. So do not let false teachers bring you a different gospel than the one that was taught to you at first. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. John 16 is a widely known verse. It is a widely loved verse. It's probably the most known verse of all the verses in the Bible. It's probably the most loved verse of all the verses in the Bible. And it plainly tells us that it is those who believe, meaning who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, accept what He did on Calvary, that will be saved. If you do not accept Jesus, you will perish. You cannot have it both ways. Either there is one way to eternal life, one way to God, or there's several ways to God, and Jesus is not the only way. We here at, hope, uh, at Hold the Hope believe that there's but one way to the Father. There's but one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the belief and acceptance of the atonement of what Jesus did for us on the cross in Calvary. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. So without Jesus as our Redeemer, you will be lost. So would you like to have that assurance? Would you like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because without Him, you will perish. But all you have to do is to ask Here's how. Say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I accept the free gift. I accept what Jesus did on Calvary for me. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to have discernment and understand your word that I might live a true and pleasing life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. As usual, what I ask, what I suggest is buy yourself a Bible. Read your Bible every single day. Highlight those verses. Learn those verses. Commit them to heart. Commit them to memory. Join a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that believe that Everybody's going to be saved. You don't have to do anything special. You, 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 all, all you got to do is that, to have breath and you'll be saved. No. Join one of those Bible-believing churches who believe there's a right way and a wrong way to live. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, you'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. Then he'll take you to be with him. Where he is, there you shall be also forever and ever and ever. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.